Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back to Pain to Passion Live. I have a lovely, amazing, beautiful, awesome, creative friend here today. This is Rachel Havacost. I have been following her on Instagram, gosh, several years at least now. Um, I got to do an interview with you a while back and it's been a bit. So I was like, wait, I haven't had Rachel actually on my podcast. She needs to be on my podcast. So here she is with me today. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you and I'm just very happy to see you and get the chance to catch up too. Yes. I'm so happy to see you as well. We're both in the same state, Washington, opposite sides of the state. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so usually I'm talking to people who are like East coast people. We're in the same time zone and everything. So that's cool, but we still haven't met face to face, which is just not okay with me. Someday. I believe, I believe in it. I believe in it too. <laughs> We're going to make it happen. It's yes. totally doable, but I'm just so thrilled that you're here with me today. And I can't wait to introduce my audience to you. Anyone who doesn't know you needs to know you and follow you, your amazing work. You're so real. You're so authentic and you're so relatable. Um, just how you engage with people is so special. And I think that's what has been so magnetic about your content and how you create and why there are so many of us who absolutely adore you. So Rachel, without further ado, can you please tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes. Um, thank you for that compliment. It really, it means a lot. Um, I, so I, gosh, where do I even start? I, uh, I started writing about my mental health, uh, in 2020, I remember it was like January 1st, 2020. I was like, okay, I'm committed. I'm going to start writing mm -hmm. about my mental health. And the reason I started doing that was, um, you know, I've been in therapy for, it's been almost 19 years now. Um, I, I was diagnosed with an eating disorder when I was 15. And, uh, and then from there, you know, a sort of a, a whole sort of <laughs> unfolding of my mental health happened where I was, I experienced depression. I experienced suicidal depression, anxiety. Um, later I, I discovered that some of the things that I was experiencing in my intimacy or relationships had to do with previous sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, so I spent, a, I spent a lot of time going to therapy and, um, but for the most part, I spent a lot of time feeling alone because when I, when I was diagnosed with my eating disorder, it was 2005, social media didn't exist. Mental mm -hmm. health was incredibly stigmatized. I mean, the word, the, the phraseology mental health was not even in, in our daily vernacular. No one was talking mm -hmm. about mental health. And, and so I really, I thought, you know, for about six or seven years, I just thought that I was the only person experiencing what I was experiencing. I didn't, mm -hmm. there was no, there was no example of here's, here are people who struggle with eating disorders or negative thought spirals or self-hatred or shame or fear or uncertainty or perfectionism or whatever it was, there weren't examples of that. And there weren't examples of that in the context of healing or getting better or recovery. There, there was only examples of, uh, you know, like I, I remember Googling some of my symptoms and all I could find were like pro anorexia websites. So everything was mm. very much a reinforcer of the, the choice I was making was not, um, I don't even like to use the, the term pathological, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. But I didn't, I didn't understand that what I was experiencing was somehow detrimental to my overall well-being. I thought that mm -hmm. I somehow was like, I had unlocked some secret superpower. And, and so I stayed sick and I stayed isolated for a really long time. And it wasn't until I went to treatment um, in, two, I think it was 2015 that I went to eating disorder treatment. Um, I was in group therapy for the first time. And I remember other people sharing very openly about their thoughts, their behaviors, their childhood, their relationships. And I remember thinking two things. The first thing was, how the fuck are these people so comfortable talking about their, their lives? Like mm -hmm. I, I operated on a do not talk about yourself sort of level for a really, really long time. My parents set an example for me, which was, we sweep everything under the rug. We don't talk mm -hmm. about feelings. We don't talk about thoughts. We just we move forward, we move forward. Mm -hmm. And so to sit in a room with people who were just so open and vulnerable and, and seem to not experience 
any embarrassment or shame or like feeling like a burden for talking about their problems or their thoughts or, or like what I constituted negative things Mm -hmm. was mind blowing to me. And then the second thing I remembered was thinking, oh my God, I've had every single thought that this person is saying, or, oh my God, that is, that is exactly my relationship with my mother. Or, oh my God, I do those things all the time. And I used to think that they made me bad and wrong, but I'm not the only one. And the, the juxt, like both of those things happening together allowed me to a see that there might be a benefit in me talking about what I was going through and actually sharing and receiving feedback or support or, or validation. And that B, I wasn't alone. I wasn't the only person experiencing what I was experiencing. And that alone gave me the willingness and openness to lean into therapy and actually listen to my therapist and actually start to learn the tools that they were offering me. Because I actually, because then I believed that it might actually help because if it wasn't a me problem and it was a common problem, then the solution might actually be relative, relevant to me. Totally. And, And so even though I'd been in therapy for years before that, I, I, I was, just, I just thought I was an unsolvable problem. I thought I was just a puzzle that could not be solved. And, uh, and so being in group therapy and learning, I wasn't alone created a lot of opportunity for me to start getting better. And so I think, you know, as the years went on, um, you know, I went to, I, I moved out to Spokane and, um, got my master's in mental health counseling because I thought maybe I can be a therapist and help other people, you know, who are, who were going through the same thing as me, uh, because it was so empowering and so helpful for my, for my well being and my livelihood. And, um, and I quickly realized that therapy was not the right modality for me. It was, I was still, there was still a lot that I hadn't worked through in terms mm-hmm. of perfectionism, in terms of, um, the pressure I put on myself to perform, um, in terms of, you know, just, just an ability to manage uncertainty and, and manage stress. I was still, I didn't have enough skill sets yet to navigate the really, really important job of being a therapist and sitting in a room with someone mm-hmm. who is suffering. Um, I didn't have the skill set yet to, to do that. And so I had to take a step back and this, and think about like, what, what makes sense for me based on what I have capacity for with my own mental health knowing that what I care about is helping people feel less alone and destigmatizing. And I've, I've always been an artist. I, my undergrad was in theater. Um, so storytelling and connecting with people through art has always been something that I have enjoyed and have been connected to. And, and writing has always been a way for me to process my own thoughts and my own anxiety and become self-aware around some of the things that I'm going through. So I started writing um, about just what I was, what about my mental health? I started writing about uh, depression. I started writing about eating disorders. I started writing about suicide and suicidal thoughts, and and I just did it for me for for a little while until I started to kind of get this idea that maybe maybe what would be helpful for people would be more stories, would be mm-hmm. more representation. The same way, like when I was fifteen, and there was no representation of what it was like to have an eating disorder or what it was like to not want to be alive. I had no examples of people who were struggling with it, nor did I have examples of people who were overcoming it. And so I thought maybe that's a hole I can fill. Maybe that's a gap that I can fill is representation and telling stories. So that's why I decided to start writing in 2020 and start writing so honestly and openly about my mental health. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's what I've been doing for the last four years, whether it's on social media or on my blog or on my sub stack, um, or in my book. Um, I'm, I'm, I look for ways to be open and transparent about what I've been through, what I'm currently going through, how I'm navigating it, what it, what it looks like or feels like on the other side in the hopes of helping one person feel less alone, destigmatizing some, some still pretty, what I think are stigmatized parts of mental illness or just being a human being in general. Mm-hmm. Um, like for example, I got divorced in the pandemic and I felt a lot of shame and stigma around that when it happened. And so that became something I started talking about more openly. Um, and then also creating safe spaces for people to show up who don't have opportunities to go to therapy or who don't have opportunities to go to a support group and feel less alone. So that's been my mission and and sort of how, you know, how everything is, has um, evolved and it has been <laughs> really wild <laughs> four years and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been really hard, but it's also been really, really rewarding. Um, and I've, I've learned a shit ton along the way. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's, that's the spiel. 
<laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, everything that you said is resonating with me so deeply. Um, I think people around our age, if we had any mental issues, mental health problems, struggles as young people, it was like that. I was like, we don't talk about this unless we're making jokes about someone. And so therefore admitting that I'm really struggling with something is like not even an option on the table. <laughs> um, but on the flip side, that need for validation, like you said, in 2005 was when you started therapy or when you were diagnosed with an eating disorder, right? And yeah. then in 2015, you were with others telling their stories. That's yeah. 10 years. 10 yeah. years is a long time to feel alone and to feel different and weird and like there's something wrong with you it's a really long time and I think what's so beautiful like it moves me almost to tears to think that you took that experience and you changed it into I don't want anyone else to ever feel this way it's so beautiful and um the sharing of stories like you said I too I think stories change the world I think people having space to openly tell their stories is what actually changes other people's lives. And you've done that so beautifully, so authentically. Um, and I've watched your roller coaster. Everyone's kind of watched your roller coaster the last couple of years. <laughs> I, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I've seen a couple points where you're like, okay, now I'm going to be an authority in the field and I'm going to like, teach people. <laughs> um, and then you're like, wait a second. No, wait, I can't do that. That's not me. That's not who I am. I'm going to be a friend. I'm going to be honest about where I'm at because everyone is in what you call the messy middle at all times. Do any of us ever actually arrive? No, <laughs> but do we pretend that we do? Yeah, we do it all the time. Um, but the way that you validate the stories of people by being so honest is exactly the experience that you received in a group. That's what so many of us have experienced with you. And I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, as far as your openness in sharing about your divorce as well, how has been opening up about that? relationship specifically and being willing to talk about the ups and downs of what that's been like how has that impacted you your mental health and how you communicate with the world it's been interesting because I I think initially I I was really private about it at first I think it took I think it took me about eight months for me to start opening up online with you know, with people that weren't my immediate family or friends about that being something I was going through, which was odd for me because I was so accustomed to being really transparent about mm -hmm. not only things I'd gone through in the past, but things I, were, I was struggling with in the present. And so it felt like this weird disconnect where I was working through, like, I was working through a lot of shock and a lot of denial. And, and I also didn't feel it was, I think, honestly, the, the one of the big challenges I had there was it was no longer just my story I was telling. It was right I, in, that in, it included him. And so mm -hmm. I also felt a, a level of pause because I wanted to be really careful about how I included him in the story of our divorce, mm -hmm. because I still loved him very much. And I didn't, I didn't hate him. I didn't want him to be a villain. I didn't want you know, I, I didn't want to somehow turn him into somebody else by including him in the story of our divorce. And, mm -hmm. and I think also in a lot of ways, I, I knew that as soon as I named it publicly, as soon as I said out loud, this is what I'm going through, it made it, it would make it real. And mm -hmm. so I think there was a lot of denial that I was going through that I had to go through that, um, you know, that was a part of the grieving process. And so I think when I finally did name it publicly and, and spoke to like, this is something that I'm, that I'm dealing with and that I'm navigating, it, it made it really real. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that was important because I spent a long time in denial and I spent a lot of time bargaining and I spent a lot of time really trying 
not to accept that that was the reality. So mm-hmm. I think by naming it and by talking about it and by writing about it, I was continuing to reinforce the the need I had, which was to accept that it was real. Mm. And I think also it it helped me reduce my own internalized shame and stigma around what it meant to be divorced. And I think that I, I mean, now I, I feel... I mean, this is one of the things that happens in our story. I, this is one of the th- biggest lessons I've learned is that the more I tell my story, whatever story that is, the less shame I feel about it. And mm-hmm. the less shame I feel about it, the more free I am to be myself. Mm-hmm. Because what ends up happening is the less shame I have, the more authentically I can show up in any relationship or dynamic. And if I'm rejected for that, then I can immediately be like, well, this is not someone I want to be around if they're going to judge me or criticize me for yeah. this experience I've had in my life. Versus true acceptance for someone being like, oh, I see you and I know you and I'm will- and I and I accept you. Mm-hmm. And so I've noticed that the more I tell stories about my experiences, the less shame I have about them, which only serves to enhance the relationships I have in my life. So I, I, I feel very uh, grateful to have a, an opportunity to, to share my, my divorce story because I don't feel any shame about it anymore, like at all, mm-hmm. like. I was in a relationship with a person I loved for a certain amount of time until the relationship was no longer what either of us needed. And we mm-hmm. fought really hard to make it work. And unfortunately, the, the right decision for us was to no longer be in a relationship anymore. And mm-hmm. that was really sad and devastating and difficult. And it, and it created a lot of change and uncertainty in my life. And I'm still here. I'm still a person. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned a lot of things because of it. And done a lot of reflection and, um, and I'm still a person and that's all, you know, like those are the facts. And so I think like by talking about it, I've been able to really reduce my own shame, which I I think also, um, you know, has given me permission to, to live life the way that I want to, rather than the way I think I'm supposed to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I think, you know, you know, like it's been very healing for me to be able to talk about it openly and, I, uh, and I know that it's something that a lot of people still stigmatize and, uh, and I think if anything, it's like, it's allowed me to free myself from other people's projections or ideas of what is good or bad or right or wrong, because I feel comfortable with my experiences. I feel comfortable with my past and my choices and who I am Mm -hmm. and what I have to offer. And if, um, if someone else has a stigma or an idea of what that means, that's, that's their, that's, that's their opinion. And that's on, that's on them. That's not, that has nothing to do with me. I don't have to take that on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been very, it's been very healing to talk about publicly. Yeah. That's beautiful. Like to hear how you have so embraced yourself on such a deep level that now when you walk into situations where people are like, Ooh, no, 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 we don't like this. You're like, okay, that's cool. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Instead of trying to uh, put yourself into that shape that they want you to be. Yeah. I mean, so I I went on a date last week and, um, and it came up in conversation. And so I, like, I told, you know, I told him I'd been divorced and, and then later on we were at dinner and he was asking me about, um, because my ex-husband and I went on this long motorcycle it was like a 10 month motorcycle trip. And that was mm-hmm. kind of our, our relationship really sort of devolved over the course of those 10 months. Yeah. And so he was asked, my date was asking me about that trip and about, you know, like where, where we went and what it was like. And then naturally it kind of like came up that on that trip, I like, we ended up separating and I left the motorcycle trip while he finished. And I remember like when I told him, when I told my date, yeah. So at a certain point, like I, I left, he laughed he like scoffed and he went, you just left. And he kind of laughed. And I, and I immediately remember thinking, there's nothing funny about this. There's nothing funny about being somewhere with my, with my husband, who I was planning on loving for the rest of my life and Mm -hmm. making a choice to, to separate. That's not funny. Mm -hmm. And what's, and what's so interesting is in that moment, that was my first automatic thought was, this is not a, this is not a laughing situation. And then the second thought I had was, wow, A year ago, if this had happened, I would have mirrored my date and laughed as well Mm -hmm. so that I could, so that I could be accepted and not rejected. 
Dang. I would have assumed that his response was the right one and that I needed to adopt it if I wanted to be, if I wanted to be loved or accepted. And it was just so interesting for me to notice how my, my, that automatic thought was so different and so changed and so true to me and what I believe. I think also like what you were saying around like, you know, 10 years is a long time to not feel like it's safe to be me or 10 years is a long time to stay, to feel isolated or alone. And and at the same time, you know, that's why it took about 10 years for me to get here now. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's taken me 10 years to get to a place where I, I'm i okay with who I am. I'm, mm-hmm. com- I'm comfortable with the experiences I've been through. I'm comfortable with the mistakes I've made. I've made peace with my life. And I've made peace with the fact that as I continue to live on, more things will happen in my life that I'm going to have to navigate and I'm not going to navigate perfectly and I'm going to have to figure it out. And and I think that like getting here has taken a lot and it's been grueling. And there have been times where I wondered like, would I, will I ever, <laughs> like, will my automatic thought ever be in service of what I believe in? Or will I always be someone who is trying to make everyone else around me happy? Or will mm-hmm. I always be someone who's trying so hard to belong that I stop being myself in order to fit in? Will I always, always, and I would ask myself these questions a lot. And so to have that automatic thought was like, so cool like yeah sucks that this motherfucker laughing about me getting divorced because up until now this was a great date (laughs) yeah you know like I had some feelings about that and some like wow this is really sucks that like this person that I maybe could like or I'm on a date with is laughing about this thing like that makes that's still hurtful right like Mm -hmm. I'm not impervious (laughs) I still I still feel things and and at the same time I was like wow this is really wild to see that this is this is where we are Mm -hmm. yeah huge growth that's super cool congratulations (laughs) (laughs) thank you (laughs) I love it I love it um and I hope that we can all continue to go on this journey to get to that place um did you even really know who you were ever in the past or is that something that you've just been learning recently you know because I think like you know I I did a a lot of um like inner child work with my therapist right after I got divorced which was really helpful um because I it was a time it was a time when I started to feel like I didn't know who I was and I remember thinking a lot of it was because I was I was trying to grieve my identity as wife my identity as his partner my identity as coupled Um, and so like, I was like, who am I now that I'm not with a partner? Who am I as a single woman? Who am I as a woman at like, who is Rachel at 30? You know, when I think I was 30, no, how old was I? 31 when we got divorced, I just was like, all of a sudden it was like, it was a blank slate. And yeah, so we did a lot of inner child work. Um, because what that helped me kind of do was tap into who I was as a kiddo yeah. When, you know, before I was sort of inundated with cultural messaging around what it means to be a girl or what it means to be a woman or what it means to um, be in this, you know, society where we're supposed to succeed or perform. So before I was sort of inundated with all this messaging about who you're supposed to be, who, who was I? Who mm-hmm. was Rach? What did I like to do? What was my personality like? What was my demeanor? You know, how did I respond to things? And So I think in some ways, like that allowed me to kind of tap into like an inherent version of Rachel. And I also know that, you know, my adult self is a, is a combination of my inherent who I am at my core. And it's a combination of that. And what, what are my beliefs? What are my values? What do Mm -hmm. I care about? And, and those things develop over time with knowledge and experience, right? Like I can't really know what I believe in until I've had some life experience or until Mm -hmm. I've been exposed to life. Right. And so a lot of those things have happened just by, by being alive and by having experiences. And, and so I think, um, I think in some ways I've always been Rachel. Like I've always, like, if you had met me when I was a teenager, I, my personality would have reflected a lot of the same things in terms of the way that I am in social situations or when I'm silly, the way I like to, to dress up and goof around or how I treat people or, 
um, my sensitivity to certain things, like all all of that would still be really true. Mm -hmm. And I have more of a structure for who I am because I now have the building blocks that keep me safe, that keep me engaged, that keep me energized. So it's things like I know how to, I know how I have healthy boundaries now. I know how to communicate my needs. I know how to ask for help. Um, I know, I know what, what my priorities are. So I know when it's okay for me to say no and when it's okay for me to say yes. Um, I no longer feel the need to, to impress everyone or please everyone. And so I'm able to be more relaxed in who I am in, situ- in cer- certain situations. And so I think that like, there's more of a solidity to who I am because I have a more clear definition of, of what the structure of Rachel is. Yeah. Yeah. I think you described that very well. That's really cool. Uh, and who we are is always evolving as well. Um, what we actually like to do or things like that can always change as well. But yeah, the essence of Rachel has always been there for sure. Yeah. Okay. Before we're done, I have to ask you about Harvard. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So again, here's my perception from the outside. Okay. All of us over here were like, yeah, of course they asked her. <laughs> and you were like, what is happening? <laughs> so I would love to hear about this experience because that was really, really cool. Okay, first of all, I'm still like, what is happening? Why did they <laughs> ask me? Um, so in, I think it was February, I got an email from Harvard that was like, you're invited to this mental, the, the first ever mental health creator summit at Harvard. Um, please email us back to confirm that you'd like to participate. And I was like, spam. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) sure. (laughs) Um, and then a few weeks later, I got another email from them and it was like, Hey, we're, we're following up. We'd like you to participate in this summit. And I, so then I was like, okay, maybe it's real, but maybe it's just like a survey or so. I just was like, I don't know what this means. I'll, I'll just respond, respond. Yes. And then like, let it be. And then about a month later, I got a DM on TikTok from a therapist and she was like, Rachel, I'm so excited to do this Harvard summit with you. Um, I can't wait to, you know, to meet you. And I was like, what is she? What? Like, and so then I went and like scrambled to check my email and like, there was an email, but it was in my, you know, like the promotions folder or whatever that was like, okay, you're, you're in this, the Harvard summit. Welcome to the, you know, the, this will be the first of several emails created what you can expect and I was like wait what what wow. is this yeah. like and and so I like looked at it more carefully and I realized that it was going to be there was going to be a virtual summit for a few months where there would be zoom meetings hosted by Harvard for a select number I think there were like 80 of us that they had selected mental health creators so people on social media that talk about mental health whether it's therapists or advocates or whatever and they would have different experts from Harvard talking about different topics and research around mental health. And, and then there was going to be an in-person two-day event or summit at Harvard in August. And, and so I remember like I attended some of the, the Zooms and I wasn't really, I, I honestly was like, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to be giving you guys information? Are you giving us information? Uh, you know, what is, what's, what is this for? Like, I remember just being confused, but also really stuck in this, like, there's, there's no, there's no really good reason why I'm here. I don't mm-hmm. understand why I'm here. There are all there are all these TikTokers that I recognize who have millions of followers or who are experts in you know ADHD or anxiety or trauma and like I'm just little old Rach talking about my life, you know? Like I just was conf- I was so confused about what I was doing there. And and so I think that got in my way of actually really engaging in those video sessions because I didn't believe that I was supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. And when they, so when they reached out and they were like, okay, now we're doing this in-person thing in August, you know, we'll, we're going to fly you out and put you in a room, in a hotel room. I was like, well, I would be, I would be stupid to say no to this, even though I don't think I should be there. Like it would be dumb for me to say no. Like it's an, it's a trip to Harvard to talk about mental health. Like that's a no brainer. <laughs> right. And, um, and I remember having so much imposter syndrome about it that I was literally looking for any excuse to not be able to go because I was oh like, gosh. I'm going to show up and they're going to be like, oh, you actually came like <laughs> this was a pity <laughs> invite. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, like my mom convinced me. She was like, Rachel, you're going to go. I'm going to take Milo. Like just go and have a good time. And so 
I get there and there's 13 of us and we're all like, I remember we all met in the morning at the hotel and we were like, do you know why you're here? No. Do you know why you're here? No. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I, like we all were like under the impression that a mistake had been made. And it's like the classic Harvard story where like, there's like this story about imposter syndrome where there's students in their first year of, of school at Harvard. And the professor's like, how many of you think that, um, you know, there's been a mistake on your application and you're not supposed to be here. And like half the room raises their <laughs> hand. Like they're yeah. literally already at Harvard. They're enrolled in school and they're still like, I'm pretty sure there was a mistake with my application. <laughs> and so like, we were all experiencing that. And it, so what happened, what, what ended up happening was like, it was the most incredible two days. It really mm. was. So essentially the public school of health um, at Harvard, which is like their whole, their whole goal at that, in that school is to get up-to-date research on public health, whether that's physical health, mental health, environmental health, and then disseminate that information to the public. So it's kind of like positive marketing um, with the goal of people just having information, right? Like up-to-date information about their health so that they can make informed decisions. And they were they started to notice in their research that people, especially adolescents, are just as likely to go online and get information about their mental health as they are to go to a doctor mm -hmm. and like hashtag mental health on TikTok is like one of the biggest trending hashtags. And a lot of, a lot of adolescents are looking for information online and on social media. And so they were like, maybe this is a, an opportunity for us to work together so mm -hmm. that when kiddos are looking for, for support with their mental health and they find creators like us on these apps, we actually have up-to-date research and information to provide them and can say, Hey, here's some actual evidence-based information about anxiety. Mm -hmm. And this is what we know, or, Hey, here are some things that are like, that are being researched right now at Harvard about the link between your air quality and your cognitive thoughts or your, you know, your ability to process information. And, and how can we work together so that we're providing accurate information for the public who is looking for information and happens to be looking to people like us on social media for that information. And so I just thought it was a brilliant idea and model mm -hmm. to enhance ethical practices on social media, specifically with mental health. Yeah. Um, and it was also incredibly validating because one of the things that they kept a lot of these, so there were Harvard professors and researchers giving us presentations about different, you know, research. And a lot of what all of them were saying is like, look, we're researchers. We're really good at numbers. We're really good at data but we're not very good at stories. And that's where you, that's where you all excel and thrive is stories. And what stories do is connect people and inspire them. So you're literally oftentimes the bridge between someone struggling and feeling courageous enough to ask for help. Yeah. And so, and so ha by telling stories, there are, there's so much opportunity to inspire and encourage people to seek support. And, and I think that that was something that they were really emphasizing, which was like, it's obvious that we have a mental health epidemic there is a mental health crisis that is that is true it's obvious that we have research and data and information and support for people that are struggling that is true what is also obvious and true is that there's a huge barrier between people who are struggling and actually accessing and getting help and a lot yeah. of that has to do with shame a lot of that has to do with stigma a lot of it also has to do with not having not having awareness or understanding of how to access support or information. And so by telling stories about our lived experience or by offering um, simple digestible ways to inform people about how they can get support, like there is a bridge that can be made. And so I just thought it was really just a really empowering and motivating experience. And, uh, you know, it's really cool because right now they're, they're working on, you know, how can we create sort of like um, a database of up-to-date research that is accessible to creators that is and so cool. create a filtration system to ensure that the creators we give this access to know how to read research, know how to share things ethically and responsibly so that it's not just a free for all and anyone can like read these papers and then, you know, maybe misread it and it then provide even more misinformation. So um, I just think it's been a really incredible idea and model and I'm super excited to see how it unfolds. That is so awesome. You just like yeah. lit up when you talked about that. That was I, so fun. I mean, mostly because I'm, my mind was fucking blown. Yeah. That Harvard cared so much about getting this information about mental health to the public that they were mm -hmm. like, we're going to try something kind of experimental or we're going to try mm -hmm. something novel or we're going to, we're going to trust that maybe like 
what's happening on social media. Like, yes, there are so many things that happen on social media that are detrimental to our mental health, that are, that's misinformation that doesn't support well-being, um, that reinforces self-diagnosis. And at the same time, there are so many positive things that are happening. So how can we focus on the positive and make that bigger to yeah. maybe try and push out the, the negative of, of what's there and, and try and make it a safer place because it's not going to go anywhere, right? So exactly. how, can we, how can we try and enhance what's good and make it safer and more ethical? And um, I don't know, it's just, I just found it very encouraging. And little Rachel was like, oh my gosh, look at yeah. this. Like yeah. people, people care about mental health. And it's like, it's something that we're, that we're working really hard to, to help. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, look at this full circle. Like, this is amazing. We start this, just even this little interview, we started talking about 15 year old Rachel alone, feeling stigmatized, doesn't understand all the things, even thinks she hacked into something cool with her eating disorder, like all that, all of that. 10 years of isolation, the whole story. Now, here you are literally being called on as someone to help as an expert in the field, make sure that other Rachel's don't get into that same situation. Like that is so cool. (laughs) I'm so proud of you. Thank you. It's amazing. (laughs) Thank you. I'm, I'm proud of us. I mean, I, you know, I don't exist in a vacuum. And so without support and without other people saying like, yes, I, I believe in this too. Like, it wouldn't matter what I say. And so like, it's such a collective effort and, Mm -hmm. and I'm just, I'm grateful to all the people that have, have said, yeah, I I want, I want this to change also. So. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this beauty with us today. Um, Absolutely adore you. Think you're spectacular and so grateful for your presence in this world. How can listeners connect with you? What's the best way for them to connect with you? Um, so you'll find everything on my website, which is just rachelhavacost.com. From there, you can find my Instagram, my TikTok, my Substack, where I do weekly newsletters. Um, and then on my website, you'll also be able to find links to my memoir, my guided journals, and I have several workshops um, as well. So that's probably like the best hub to find all of the resources. Well, well, everything will be linked in the show notes. So for anyone who's looking for more info or to go read your book, which is extraordinary. I read it in one day sitting by a lake in where was I? Sandpoint, Idaho. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's very, very good. And just one of those books that will open your heart up in a way that you need for healing. So well done on so many things, Rachel. And for the listeners, thank you for being here. And I hope you will connect with Rachel on Instagram. Go check out her website, her TikTok, all the places, because she's great and you will be so encouraged and you won't feel alone. Thank you, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.